what I want to do. I want to do this. 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 I want to do that. I want to do this. Starting to get good at this, I think. Oh, well, maybe not. Now I can't see it. All right. So multivariable control. Everyone's got a PowerPoint on their screen. Yes, sir. Right on. Okay. So multivariable control. The best way that I can explain multivariable control in simple terms, uh, just so that you can kind of go into it with a, a very, very general understanding. It's basically kind of the idea of uh, a ratio control system where we had a controlled stream and we had a wild stream. And if we made a change on one, the law on the wild stream, the other side would have to compensate for it in order to keep our ratio the same. Multivariable is like that times two. That's a simple. And after everything I've said at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, the way that it's going to be described to you is going to be much more complicated. All right, so let's have a look here. Why do we need to know this? You must understand the effects of control loop interactions so that you can troubleshoot, configure, and tune the multivariable system. So the difference, I guess, between multivariable and, and ratio is this definition of, of an interaction. And the interaction is, uh, if I make a change on one, does it change the other? And that's what an interaction kind of is. So our objectives here describing the advantage of applications of multivariable control. Uh, what is it? Multivariable control uses two or more PV inputs to affect the action of the system. So two, two PV inputs. A multivariable strategy is used to minimize the reaction between two or more controlled variables. Doesn't make sense right now, but we'll look at a picture here. Okay. Uh, We'll build, on, we'll build on the first two slides because that's kind of what our objectives are. Uh, first, we're going to look at what loop interaction is and get a practical uh, example of what it is. So when we're using multivariables on a process, there may or may not be interaction between the loops. It might be a negligible interaction or it might be severe. If we can't tolerate interaction, we have to do something about it, and that's why we have come up with multi uh, multivariable schemes or I guess deals of improving multivariable schemes. So looking at what an interaction looks like between a loop, we have a very simple level process. And the way we, we can tell if there's an interaction is we make a change in one of the controlled variables, and then we ask, does it affect the process variable of the opposite thing? So for example, if I was to increase the flow, to the uh, level valve here, what's going to happen? The level, of course, is going to increase. Is it going to increase or decrease our outflow? The answer is no, because the outflow is controlled by the flow transmitter, which is controlling this valve. So there's no interaction between this and this. However, if I were to increase the outflow, what's going to happen? It's going to cause the level to go down. So in this case, there is an interaction. So in its simplest form, that's how we define what an interaction is. So it's when a multi manipulated variable affects more than one controlled variable. So in the previous example, a flow change caused a level change as well as a flow change. So if we have the interactions, we have to do something about it. Uh, we can try to tune it out as two individual loops, which works sometimes, but if it doesn't, and the reason we have this ILM, we have to adopt a strategy to be able to control it. The two types that we're going to look at in the organization of this ILM is a little bit less than ideal, but uh, the two multivariable strategies that we're going to look at are called centralized control, which we're going to look at really quickly um, because it's primitive. Uh, and then the second one is called decoupling control, which is what the majority of the ILM is based on. And it is uh, really complicated to read, but not that complicated in practice. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, uh, centralized control strategy is a uh, control strategy that is 
determined from a process model. Okay, it, it, it determines how it's going to affect the final control elements through a process model. This can be calculated mathematically uh, by, a, by a machine if it wanted to be, or a, a program, or you can sit down and you can actually do some tests and, and get some data. But long story short, when we're talking centralized control strategy, it's identified or defined basically by the fact that it uses a process model to determine the outputs to the final control elements. And in yellow here, that's a self-test question. So, Okay, so a centralized control strategy uses all the measurements to calculate the outputs simultaneously. So here we see we're measuring the flow uh, and the level here. We're taking both of those measurements, putting them into a controller. The controller is doing some magic and it is providing an output to the final control elements respectively at the same time. So that's the containment of what defines a centralized control strategy. There's different types of centralized control uh, strategies. Uh, they are model predictive and dynamic matrix. Don't worry about anything more than that. That's that's all that we really need to know. That's on page three. So let me just check there, page three again. This book changed quite a bit since my last ILM. Um, so I just want to make sure that everything's kind of good. Dun, 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 loop around, loop interaction, security, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it doesn't even really say that in there anymore. So end of subject when we're talking about centralized control strategy. It doesn't even say centralized anywhere. All right. So no big deal then. We don't, we don't even have to worry about that anymore. So model predictive, centralized, wonderful. Um, we're going to be focusing more on dynamic matrix. So when we have two separate loops and we try to work with them, that's that's one thing. But of course, uh, like the object here is multivariable, so multiple different loops. And in order to prevent the interaction of one loop with the other loop and vice versa, we have to come up with one of these deep coupling strategies. And we're going to be looking at it, uh, lots of math here. So uh, the, the coupling strategy is a strategy basically where interacting loops are automatically compensated when one acts. So just like in ratio, when we had a change in one, it multiplied that controller output by a certain uh, value and applied it to the other controller and it, and it, and it adapted. Same idea, except that this is going to work either direction or both at the same time. Uh, Multi-loop strategy uses multiple single loop control. So very basically looking like this. Um, two different controllers, a flow controller here and a level controller here. This is called multi-loop. It's also, again, primitive, and we're, we're kind of building on this uh, with multivariable as a subject here. We, we're going to we're going to advance here in a second here. So we ask ourselves the question, is there loop interaction between the control loops? Yeah, we, we determined this earlier. Uh, we increase the flow, it affects the level, but if we increase the flow in, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect the flow. So there's interaction. So we want to, uh, we want to minimize this. So how do we do this? All kinds of fancy math, and the fancy math starts here. Okay, we start out with something called the relative gain. And a relative gain is a measurement of the amount of interaction between the two loops. The reason we need to use relative gain because it is used to determine the best pairing of controlled variables. And this is going to blow your minds uh, as, we, as we're talking about it. Um, and it's the main reason why I've decided today that I'm going to break this uh, uh, ILM into two separate lectures. So I'm going to hit you kind of hard and heavy today, walk you through this, possibly possibly blow your minds a little bit. But I'm going to make another, another presentation that's going to go into the, the stuff that we're going to look at in the next 10 or so slides in a little bit more depth. Um, so that you've had the chance to go see it once, read it once, and then we'll go back and we'll look at it again so you can kind of wrap your brain around it because it's a little overwhelming the first time you look at it, but the second or third time you look at it, it turns out to be quite simple. Yes, they are provided in the formula sheet. Okay, so what is relative gain? Uh, it's a gain relatively. It's the ratio of the open loop gain to the closed loop gain. 
Uh, that's a definition that you need to know. It's a relative gain, one relative to the other. And we'll determine that and you'll see all kinds of different math. Okay, so relative gain we determine by finding out the difference between open loop gain and closed loop gain. So we'll obviously have to figure that out somehow. And when we do find these values, we end up putting them into something called a relative gain matrix. And that's what RGM stands for, a uh, relative gain matrix, which is derived from an open loop matrix. And you're probably already at this point uh, going, oh, Jesus. And if that's true, you can raise your hand or scream or whatever you want to do. But this is our objective here is, is we're going to find out uh, how to make a relative gain matrix from an open loop matrix. And it involves using all these fancy formulas that are in your formula book. Um, the good news is fancy formulas are in your formula book. The bad news is uh, if you don't remember how to found, find out uh, dead time, T1 time and K from an open loop graph, you're gonna uh, you're gonna struggle a little bit trying to get your memory back to where it needs to be. Okay, so we start out with this concept of determining an open loop matrix. We have to do that because it contains the static mean values needed for calculating the relative gain, so that we can make our relative gain matrix. And this all builds up to how do we set this up? Where do we get the math and the values set up so we know how this one needs to affect this one and how needs this, this one needs to affect it, this one, how we can cancel it out so we get the most stable and acceptable process operation, long story short. Okay, so to calculate these values, let's look at what we're going to we're going to get here. We get this open loop matrix and what we get here is some values indicated by these KP numbers and there's all kinds of wonderful stuff associated with this. It's first time around it's tough, next time around it won't be so bad. But what these numbers represent is the interaction or the result of the test. So I have controller one and controller two and what I do is I would put them in manual and there's a slide that I'll talk about this uh, coming up a little bit but basically what happens is I'm doing a test first with controller one I do a test and I find out what the results of this test are on the first process variable and the second process variable this is how I find out the static gain so it's changing changing input just over changes input over changes output so static gain right that'll give us a number that'll give us a number then I do the same test with the second controller and then that'll give me a number, and that'll give me a number. Everything that we're going to talk about going forward is based on this and the simple output over input. And this is a review from last year. Okay, it's not that simple going forward looking at it, but ultimately that is what it is. So KP11 here is a function of the change in PV1 by the change in CO1. Okay, KP21 is change in PV2 over the change in CO1. So you can see here, the one in the front here, oops, this one is tied to the PV, the second digit is tied to the CO. That's how the formulas come around. If for some reason you lost your eyesight and you couldn't look at the formula book, but the formula book will tell you this, but just so you know, this one here, two PV2, one CO1, this one, one PV1, to CO2. So if you say, if I said to you, you know, what's the formula for KP12? Well, you know, it's PV1 over PV2. If I say for KP22, you know, it's PV2 over CO2. The reason I'm spending a whole bunch of time talking about this is when I first read this, I just looked at these and went, oh my God, this is all kinds of crazy stuff, but it's really quite, it's really fairly simple. Okay, so this is how we get the open loop matrix, the first building block moving forward. Of course, it doesn't. It gets a little bit more complicated, of course, but this is a this first step. Okay, so in order to get these calculations, here's the process from page seven. Um, put both process, process controllers in manual and stable near their set point. So whatever that happens to be, wherever you're going to operate. Then we're going to step the first controller. Wait for steady state. 
And then we're going to calculate the static gain for both processes as a result of that change in controller one. So we're going to do that by filling in our change in uh, PV over our change in input. Okay. Then we're going to step it back down to where we were before we started. Where we're going to wait for steady state again. And it's important to be patient. And then we're going to step the second controller, same amount. And we're going to wait for steady state again. And then we're going to calculate the gain for both of those processes. Okay. Boom, boom. So now we've got numbers for both of our processes. And that's from one of these, uh, from, do, 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 let me, from one of these graphs here, right? We did a, we did a step in the controller, 10% here. This one changed by 13%. This one changed by 8%. So this is way down the road, but that's the same graph. Okay, so that's that's where we get these numbers. So here's an example. I apologize for the technology. This is part of what I'm going to um, revamp here a little bit. But let's just say we, we had a question, and I apologize that this doesn't match the question in the ILM anymore. But let's just let's just say what happened here. And this is just describing what happened when we did a test. So it says develop the open loop matrix and a relative gain gain matrix and determine the best pairing to uh, minimize interaction for a two by two multivariable system from the following experimental results that we got from doing a test in, in a graph. Okay, so here's the results of our two controller changes. We did a 10% change in a controller and uh, it changes 7% in the one PV and 6% change in the other PV. Then we did the other controller with the same 10% change and it caused a negative 12% change in one of them and a positive 5% uh, change in the other one. So if I take these numbers here, 7%, I put it in there. So CO1 with PV1, uh, my chart's not even right. I don't know why these are these are wrong. Let's just say that this is CO1 and this is CO2. So that's seven percent. That goes right here. Uh, CO1 with PV2 should be six, which goes right here. CO2 and PV1 is twelve percent or point or one point two, and PV1 point uh, five here. Uh, CO1 with PV one. That's where you get the numbers from. Okay, so simply that's, that's these numbers here in scribbly style over here. So what did I get here? I got 7%. This 7% and this 10% gives me the 0.7. Uh, this 6%, this 6% and this 10% gives me this 0.6. This minus 12 compared to this 10 gives me the 1.2. This plus five and this 10 here gives me this 0.5. Okay, so that's that's where I got these numbers here. Sorry about misleading you here when I said when I said this and this, that's not true. It came from come from here. Okay, so getting those values is very difficult. We, we do the we do the chart, we get our changes over output over input, and then that's where that's where we get these numbers. And I'll do a prettier version of that next time we talk. Okay, so then we continue with that, and you'll see that we end up getting uh, a new formula here. This is our relative gain matrix. It looks awfully familiar to an open loop matrix, except you'll see here uh, it's got the name relative gain matrix. And I don't know why, for some reason, uh, the variables didn't show up here, but inside here, there should be some variables. They are these new values that you can't see because I've scribbled over top of them. Um, to, in order to find these new values that I've calculated here already, you simply uh, use the formulas and the numbers that you've calculated previously. So this K11 is the same as the K11 that gets plumped into this formula. So there's nothing really new. You, all you're doing is we're finding out these numbers and we're using these numbers in predetermined formulas that you'll find in your formula book. All you're gonna do is the math as required and you'll and you get the proper answer. So, okay, so from the previous page, uh, these would be my K values. 
and you, you can't really uh, you can't really see them very well, but that's that's what they are. So I'll take these k values in order to fill in this chart. 11 and 22 use this formula. 12 and 21 use this formula, and I'm just using my values here. So 11 times 22, or 0.7 times 0.5, right here, 0.7 times 0.5, and then 11 times 22, you'll see same thing, 0.7 times 0.5, minus 12 and 21, so 1.2 and 0.5, there and there, gives me this and this, gives me this and this, and then gives me that number, 0.32. This is what I'm using for 11 and 22. So running out this formula, Using the values from my open loop, open loop matrix gives me this value for 11 and 22. I'll then go and I'll put it in my relative gain chart in these two areas here. You can, so you can see under there would be 11 and 22. Put those values in there. To get these two values, simply take the calculated value and subtract it from one. And that will give us 0.672, and we put that into both of these values. Okay. Looks complicated, but it's not that bad. So, what does it mean? We calculated these numbers. A relative gain of 0.672 is used to tell us how the other loop responds in auto. So, relative to each other, this is how they are. So, we use that number to determine how a change in one controller affects the other loop. So in order to find the number that actually represents that, we divide this value uh, by one. So we do one divided by 0.672 gives us a 1.48. So that means when we change the one loop, it's gonna, its controller output is gonna be multiplied by a factor of 1.48. Okay, that's, that's the, uh, which combination here? Oops, 672. So if I make a change in controller two, it's gonna affect PV1 and PV2, okay? So controller two, PV2, these are the pair that are normally working together. We're not too worried about them. We're worried about how it affects the other loop here. Okay, so it affects the other loop by a factor of 1.48. And that's pretty big. It's not huge big, but it's big. Do the same math on the other pairing, the 0.333 pairing here. We find out that we make a change in one and it affects the other by a factor of 3.125, which is way worse. So the problem here is if I make a change in one and it affects the other loop by a factor of three, that's bad. Okay, so the, the idea here from doing these calculations is to figure out which pairing of controller and, and valve gives us the smoothest operation. I know it's kind of complicated. So the long-term short story here is we want a number as close to one as possible. Okay, so in, in this case here, we would prefer to have the pairing that creates uh, this value here, or we prefer to have the pairing of controller two with PV2. We'll talk more about this later. This is just math first time around, so you can wrap your head around it. Okay, so if the relative group uh, loops produce a relative gain between 0.9 and 1.1, and this is a fact uh, out of the ILM, it says that a multivariable strategy is not required, which means that that one loop hardly interacts on the other loop at all. It, it multiplies its output by 0.9 or by 0.1. So the effect on the other loop is pretty minimal. Therefore, we don't need it. And that's why we want to pick the loop pairing that's closest to one. Okay, preferably positive one less than one is not bad either. Okay, uh, a relative gain of zero would indicate no interaction. Uh, and what that means is if we switch from manual to auto, there's there's not going to be any bumps, no hiccups, everything's going to be happy. So in the ILM on page 10 here, it kind of gives you an explanation of, of the comparative reactions uh, between um, the loop pairings. So they'll tell you in there that uh, 
One, of course, is the best. You make a change in one, it affects the other one exactly the same. That's awesome. Um, but the page 10 uh, in the ILM here will kind of explain what's going on in here and speaks directly to uh, what's the difference between this and this and this in its relationship to one, the ideal. So we have interactions between loops, obviously. We've proven that if we make a change in one, this happens. If we make a change in the other, this happens. How do we how do we minimize that? How do we get around that? So the answer is a decoupling control strategy. And the decoupling control strategy is a strategy that is used to minimize this interaction between loops. And you can see what happens here when we throw in this little machine called a decoupler, or it's not a machine really, it's a, a piece of software. This little decoupler will take the signal from the one controller, provide a multiplier that gets added to the signal from the other controller that goes to the valve. Similarly, the change in the other one will provide a signal that gets summed with its value that gets sent to the other valve. So a change in one affects a change in the other, but by a ratio that we have calculated and can control. And that's what the next little chunk of math uh, talks about. So up till now we've determined uh, the severity of interaction using the previous math calculations. Now we're going to be looking at how do we uh, mitigate the effect of interaction by using a decoupler and all kinds of decoupler math. Uh, so when we're doing decoupler math, we are in essence finding the values of D1 and D2 uh, that are going to be applied to the um, complementing controller uh, in order to minimize loop interaction. It's a lot. Okay, where do we use this? This is applications. So one of our objectives in the ILM, key objectives, uh, was to describe applications of multivariable control. Uh, and the previous three, uh, three, four, five, six slides, uh, while they are important, um, are a lot of pages to accomplish one of the objectives, and this is one page that accomplishes one of the objectives. So this page here carries just about as much weight as the previous 10 pages. Okay, so applications where we use multivariable, uh, common applications, temperature processes, mixing processes, and heated reacted, uh, reactor processes. And you'll see examples of these as we go through. Uh, the ILM. I'm not going to talk about them individually here because I'm already thinking at this point in time your brains are probably full. Um, it's, the processes themselves are relatively easy to understand. I think by the time you get to fourth year, it's not going to be difficult for you. Um, but pages 11 and 14 will describe the inherent uh, properties of each process and how multivariable comes into play uh, with each of them. And it will give you a good idea of why, why we want to use multivariable and decoupling uh, strategies in particular. Okay, so moving into decouplers again, this is the big thing here. A decoupler is a feedforward control element that compensates for any change a controller will have on a manipulated variable. So here we go, things are getting real. So in order to find the settings to put into a decoupler, there's all kinds of funky toodly math, um, but ultimately what we're doing when we're talking about decoupler design is we're calculating the static gain, the lead time, lag time, and dead time that we are going to put into a decoupler block, okay? And it's relatively complicated, um, but the good news is once you have some basic numbers, these ones, it's pretty simple to apply formulas to them. Okay, so this is a block diagram of a decoupler. You'll see it again when we um, talk about the block diagrams, but simply, uh, simply put, you'll take a signal that comes out of this controller. It affects its own process variable, but it also, through a decoupler, will affect the process variable of the, the other loop. Uh, the idea here is that we have elements in here that we enter 
so that the signal uh, signal that we generate here doesn't create a big upset over here and vice versa. So the next little chunk involves uh, using some stuff again from third year, our transfer functions and associated math. Okay, so here's first step is verifying uh, the transfer functions that we get from our charts. So as a review, just to make sure that we can figure out where we get all these values again, dead, uh, sorry, the gain is the first value, dead time is this upper value, our T1 time, <coughs> oh my goodness, excuse me, is this bottom value. So let's see, uh, G11, PB1 with controller one, uh, well, this is the test with controller one, as you can see, CO1 has been stepped up by 10%. Uh, PV1 has changed by 15%. So change in output, 15 over change in input, 10, gives us a gain of 1.5. Looks good to me. We draw our fancy dancy line here, our tangent line, and where the tangent line uh, crosses is about you know, there, I guess. The difference between there and there is our dead time. In this case, they're telling us two. Uh, and the difference between uh, here and 63.2% of 15 is seven, which is our T1 time down here. Does anybody have any questions about this review stuff? from last year because now would be a good time to ask. No? Perfect. Okay, then just really fast, we'll do the second one. So again, uh, controller output one, PV two, so 10 over 10, gain of one, dead time 2.4, and T1 time of 1.5. And then of course we'll do this with the second controller. So this is the first controller in the two loops. This is the second controller step change, results with the two loops. And again, getting the same values here in order to get our thing. So you'll notice that same graphs can generate the transfer function. The same graphs are also used to calculate the static gains that we used here. Right, same test. All right, so from this, we find the values for D or our decouplers. Uh, finding the lead, lag, lead time, lag time, and the dead time for the D, the decouplers. Uh, good news, settings are found by using formula, which we'll find in our formula book. And these formulas here are our transfer functions. Uh, do I have these mixed up here? I'm, I just threw this together today. So this graphic, oops, sorry. This graphic, uh, let me just double check. Might not represent what I wanted to say. It could be a mistake. Don't want to do that. D1, 21 over 22. Whoa, I got the wrong formulas in here. See, how did I manage to do that? These are right. These are wrong. Stop it. All right, so my graphic is wrong on here. So uh, page 16 is where we're at here. If you want to see and you can follow along with the proper numbers here. Uh, I can't edit it right now, but this should be here and this should be here. They're backwards anyway. So follow along. I actually, uh, yeah, okay. So follow along with me on page 16 if you can. Uh, you'll see that these formulas uh, starts out with uh, the GP formula here, which represents our correct transfer functions, which these ones are. And then there's another formula uh, that comes in after it. And what that formula is, is it has the transfer functions uh, related to GP21 and GP22. So in this case, um, 
what the hell I got going on here. In this case, we're going to have 1 over 1.3. These my graphics are all messed up here. So if you look on page 16, you'll see we have the transfer function uh, 1e minus 2.4 over the transfer function 1.3 minus uh, 2.0s, those two transfer functions, and then they roll out the math. And then you're going, okay, how the heck did they how the heck did they do that? Because this is where we're getting the lead time, lag time, and dead time from. And this little block down here tells us uh, how to get those values. So if you look to the right of the stack transfer functions, you'll see that there's a minus 1.0 over a 1.3. I wish I could fix this right now. Uh, I can't. Okay, there's a 1.0 over 1.3. So comparing that to the transfer function, basically it's going to be this gain minus this gain as they sit, right? Gains divided as they are. So the upper gain divided by the lower gain. So that's the first formula. The second formula is going to be this T1 time and this T1 time, but flipped, okay? So not matching numbers. Uh, for this example, it would be uh, 1 plus 1.5 over 1 plus 0.7. In the ILM, they're both the same, and they show 1 plus 1.5 over 1 plus 1.5. So T1s are flipped and divided. So the bottom one goes on top, and the top one goes on bottom. The opposite that we did with the gains. Okay. Then the third sub-formula you see to the right of the DQ2 calculation on page 16 is simply subtracting the dead times and they are subtracted as they are, meaning top minus the bottom. So I apologize for having the wrong transfer functions in here. Um, but if we do that math, um, as it shows on page 16 and page 17, we get the values to put into our uh, decouplers. So the D1 values here, uh, if we run out the math, correctly, which I didn't do, you would find that our gain is 0.77, uh, and we'll talk about why this isn't there right now. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, our D2 values, if you ran out the math, you would find that the gain uh, is going to be 0.53. The lead time will be 7 minutes, the lag time will be 5 minutes, and our dead time will be 0.8 minutes. Uh, it'll talk about the why the lead and lag time aren't required in here, uh, and basically the what it says in the ILM at the lead time and the lag time are very close together. And I think the example in the ILM, they're like a half a minute apart or something like that. I can't remember what I, I should look. They don't even run out the math in the ILM. But anyway, if they're very close together, you don't need to worry about them. There's a long story short, if they're very small. Uh, these ones here are larger, seven minutes. So again, this is the response or the dynamics of the process. So, uh, they're, they're compensated for. This is a little messy, I apologize. Uh, this is where we're going to stop. And this is probably why I got to this point and I said this is where we're going to stop. Uh, the next section, uh, I believe, is out of order. Um, it talks about block diagrams for a little while here, a couple of processes, and then it gets back into some more, uh, some more math, which doesn't make any sense to me. But at any rate, uh, that's where we're going to stop today, uh, and I'm going to go back here. I'm going to tidy this math up a little bit. I'm going to tidy uh, this math up here a little bit, make you guys a nice little show. Um, I hope this worked out for you. I admittedly error on my part here, having the wrong values in there. Um, but read the rest of the ILM today, regardless of uh, not seeing the PowerPoint. The, the worst is pretty much behind us, so I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it at that.